We handed out the, the vision of, the, of Open Heaven last week. My part of it is to present you fully formed, fully perfected, mature in Christ before him. That's Colossians 1, 28, 29. That was what I got when he called me into ministry. That's the thing. That's what I focus on. How can I bring you to a fullness in Christ? That's, that's what he's going to ask me. The thing that scares me is that on the day of judgment, he's going to praise God, it's mercy, but he's going to ask about the state of every soul that went through open heaven. And I really don't want to answer that because sometimes I haven't been the best pastor I could be. You know, sometimes I've assumed things that you knew and you probably didn't. So praising God for his grace and mercy. But I really want to see you achieve in life what he has put within you to achieve, right? I don't want you living below what Christ has died to give you. And he has designed a plan and a purpose for each and every one of you. And some of you are living it. Some of you are still kind of like, I think this is it, but I'm not sure. Um, but I'm going to show you a path that will help to clear the way. And then we're going to pray a prayer of repentance at the end for those who want to, a prayer of cleansing, and take communion and worship. But what I'm talking about is your imagination. Your imagination. And it can be either carnal or Christ-like, or sometimes a mix. But it's your imagination. That's the very thing that God said in Genesis chapter 11, that what they have imagined to do is going to happen unless I step in. So this is going to be about your imagination and why it is so important and so powerful and, uh, and what exactly is it? And, and when I talk about imagination, like what do you see? And I'm not talking about the seers and the prophets that see things. Like what do you see? But what do you see when you get a phone call that say, hey, the kids, you know, like the kids come home late at night, like as a single mum. They're supposed to, they had a cutoff time. They were supposed to be home by curfew and they haven't turned up. The first thing that goes through my mind is, oh God, please let them be all right. Which goes to show that my imagination was first and foremost negative. Have they been in an accident? Are they okay? All that kind of thing. So what is the first thing that you see or you think when something happens? Where does your imagination take you? Do you end up in a place of peace or do you end up in a place of worry? Mustn't lean on the pulpit. Don't let me lean on the pulpit. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't think the path can get any narrower. <laughs> So what do you see? Like really, when things happen, what is it that you see? Where does it take you? To a place of peace or a place of worry? And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, Paul, Paul was praying and he said, I pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he would grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And so this is the very first thing Paul mentions in his prayer. And this is a, a spiritual covering that he's praying over the church at Ephesus. And he's saying, the first thing that I want you to have from the Father of glory is a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And revelation, if you go down to verse 18, is having the eyes of your heart flooded with light. But sometimes our imagination is flooded with darkness. It's just, it just doesn't go the way of the light. So revelation, what do you see? What is it that you are imagining? And do you have the wisdom of God combined with that? Or is it the wisdom of man? You know, there's so many different things. But like I said, there is two types of, of imagination. And the first one is in Genesis 11, chapter 6, when they're building the Tower of Babel. So we know it's not a good thing. And God actually has to come down and intervene. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have one language. So unity was really important. So what, what had happened with building the Tower of Babel, they had cast a vision. Let us build this tower. Let us make a name for ourselves. 
Let us do this. Let us let us reach the heavens. They're saying we don't want we don't we can build our own way to God. We don't need to do it his way. And so that they cast the vision in such a way that the people responded and they came into unity. They had one language. They were in unity about the vision that had been cast. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people that have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And now nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. Nothing they imagine can be impossible. And so God has to step in. He has to change some things. And so he said, I'm going to go down there and we're going to confound their language that they can't understand each other's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the place upon the face of the whole earth and they gave up building the city. So God actually had to come in. He had to intervene. He had to say, hey, this can't happen. And so I recognise the power of your imagination. Recognise the power of it. If you can come into unity, now when two or three are gathered together, you know, it will be done for them as, as they're in agreement. Well, you can't come into agreement unless you can both see the same thing, unless you're in agreement about what you're praying about. So that agreement, that unity is, is, is so powerful. But one thing that we, we don't understand is that the power of the imagination, and most of us don't want to touch the power of the imagination because, hey, you know what, it's unsanctified, you know, it's part of the old man, it's part of the new man. It's part of the new man. It's part of the new creation. But we, we need to ask God to forgive us of the sins of the imagination and sanctify our imagination that it would be used only for his use. But there is such a power in imagination and we're going to look at it. And I'm telling you, this is one of the blockages for some of you why you are not walking in the fullness of what God's got for you, why you're not walking in the provision he's got for you, why you're not seeing the health that he's got for you, why you're not seeing the breakthrough in family relationships that he's got for you, why you're just coming up against obstacle after obstacle, I can tell you that this is one of the keys. And so I pray for you to get a spirit of wisdom and revelation about the power of the imagination and how to use it for the glory of God and for the good of yourself, that it would not work against you, which it does. It does. It will work against us or it will work for us, with us. And this is a gift from God. And when we got born again, every part of us got touched. Now I have to renew my mind and I will have to renew my imagination as well. But it is powerful. Because he said, the Lord said, nothing they can do is impossible. All things are possible with God. But he said, with the imagination. They're in agreement. They're in agreement. They've cast the vision, they agree on the vision, they're in one language, they're in unity about this, and they are all seeing and imagining the same thing, nothing can stop them. So the Lord said, I have to go down there and break this up. Can you see how important your imagination is? So, imagination is simply ideas that turn into pictures in your mind. That's all it is. It's just ideas that become pictures. You know, the kids wouldn't come home by the curfew and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, they're on a, they've, they've just got their licence, maybe they're in a car crash and then I'm just thinking those ideas and all of a sudden in my head I can see the car mangled. You know, it's, it, just, it just took off in a life of its own. Imagination is the formation of an image. And let me tell you what Zig Ziglar said about it. Zig Ziglar said that the most powerful nation on the world is not America, after all, but imagination. <coughs> Play on words, imagination. That is the, the uh, most powerful imagination in the world. <coughs> imagination is really the destination that you see for yourself. It is the destination that you see for yourself. It's where imagination is where you have the idea of where you're going fully printed on your mind in living colour. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. As you think in your heart. Now, I worked at, you know, that RTO place and they had two RTOs. There was the sport one and then there was the success college. And I used to work in the success college as well. 
And part of that was <clears throat> your life will follow your dominant thought. So if you're thinking constantly, I don't have enough money to pay the bills, guess what? Your life will actually follow that thought and reinforce it for you because as you think in your heart, that's who you are. That's the, the, the flow of your life. That's where it takes you. Does this make sense? And so it's really important that we start to take hold of these things. We start to bring these things back into the obedience to Christ. And we recognize what is your dominant thought regarding health, finances, family? What's your dominant thought regarding ministry, business? What's your dominant thought about your life? Because what your dominant thought is, the one that you think about, that's where you end up. And as, I was, as, as a single mum years ago, my dominant thought was any time I took a step forward, I always seemed to be knocked backward. Anyone ever been there? Mm, yeah. And so my thought was, what's the point of even trying? Nothing changes. So I had to work really hard to change that because while that was the dominant thought of my life, that's the direction my life flowed. This is why it's so important. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Your mental picture determines your future. And it does matter. Because one of the things that I used to say too is, oh, it doesn't matter. But Danielle is really good at picking me up. And she says, everything matters. Everything matters. So if you turn over to Genesis 13, my favourite scripture where I just seem to be living lately, Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15 the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had left him, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are, north, south, east and west. For all the land which you see I'll give to you and to your posterity forever. And I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth so that if a man could count the dust of the earth, then could your descendants also be counted. Who could ever count the dust of the earth? Can you imagine what that would be, have done to his mind? Like that, that many descendants? But he's saying, lift up your eyes now and look north, south, east and west for as far as you see, as far as you see, that's what you'll have. So what are you seeing when you look to the future? What are you seeing? He had to look up from where he was and look into the future. What do you see when you look into the future? Because the imagination is the pace setter for your destination. I mean, that's, that's what it is. It's the pace setter. As far as your eyes can see, Oral Roberts has written a fabulous book called If You Can See It, You Can Possess It. It's a great book. But imagination is the power to achieve or the power not to achieve. Your choice. As you think in your heart, so you are. So what are you thinking? So sometimes we can get a doctor's report and we start thinking, because I know that you know, the doctor's report to my dad, you know, you've got a, um, an aggressive cancer, you know, you've only got so long, so dad started thinking death. But that's, that's not what God tells us to think about. Because the devil comes to steal, kill and destroy. So if I'm thinking death, I'm thinking in line with the, the devil, right? Mm -hmm. I need to be thinking abundant life. Mm -hmm. If I'm thinking in lines of sickness, then I have forgotten 1 Peter 2.24, by the stripes of Jesus Christ, I've been healed. If I'm thinking old age, you know, like the number of people, oh, you're 70 now, you should expect to. No, I don't, because the Lord is renewing my youth. He's renewing my youth. You know, Psalm 92, I'll still be fruitful in my old age, and I'm not there yet. If we think failure, oh, you know, like I've just started a startup business and I, I'm not too sure how it's going to go. I think my business might fail. We've forgotten Joshua 1.8 where God says that we can make our way successful by meditating the word of God. If you've got problems in the family, then we've got Acts 16.31 where he says, as for you and your family, it's going to be saved. So what are you thinking? And half the time, we are not even aware of what we're thinking because it's in our subconscious it's in our subconscious. We have thought it so much that it has so deeply entrenched itself in our mind and in our heart that that's the path you automatically go down. Excuse me, can there also be um, memory structures? Yes. That in the yep. Yeah. And memory structures can build into the, the imagination. Yes. 
You have to be careful what you watch because that will, that will affect your imagination as well. There's a whole lot of things and what goes in the ear gate, what goes in the eye gate, um, you know, your, your feelings. But what actually, in the privacy of your own room when there's no one there, what are you actually thinking? Are you lonely? Do you think about loneliness? Well, the Lord said he'd never leave you. He'd never forsake you. That he's with you until the end of the age. So there's all these things that we think about, but they, they defy scripture. They actually defy scripture. You know, um, your parents might have said, oh, you'll never amount to anything. And in the back of our head, that's still there. But that's not true because God said he's going to position you above the nations. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. So what actually do you think? To make sure, to keep, now, when I first read this in a book, I got so angry that I threw the book across the room because it said where I am in life is exactly because of what I've been thinking. And I thought, oh, ridiculous, ridiculous. I'm not thinking like, you know, I am not here because of that. But I was there because of that, because I was, I was thinking the wrong kind of thoughts and it had become um, subconsciously there. And so when I read that book, man, I was so angry with that book, man, I threw it across the room. I did not want to see that as the truth at all, but it was the truth. It was the truth. In the quiet of your own home, when there's no one with you, when you're by yourself, where do your thoughts go? Is there an area in your life where you are stuck? Where you just can't seem to move ahead, you just can't seem to get out of debt, or you just can't seem to find your feet, you're just not quite sure which door to go through. You know that one season is ending and another one's opening up, oh, I'm just not quite sure what it is, where it's going. That's darkness, that's not light. And so recognise that as you think in your heart, so you are. And that as you think in your heart becomes an imagination where that image is etched into your subconscious and becomes, like Leah said, like a memory structure that keeps you there. You know, in, and I've, I've used this phrase so many times, but Napoleon Hill in his book, is it Interview with the Devil, Danielle? Napoleon Hill, interview with the devil, in that he said, if you can get people thinking in a certain way long enough, they actually become hypnotised and entranced by the thought and cannot get themselves out of it. So, you know, if you're, you're, you're always in debt and always struggling to get enough money, and if he can get you keep thinking poverty, keep thinking poverty, keep struggling to find the money, if he can get you to keep thinking like that, that will actually hypnotize you. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the blindfold, Satan blindfolds, you know, so that you can't see the truth. This is why we've got to be rigorous in our walk with God. We've got to take the time to sit with him and allow him to ask us questions. You become a drifter. And you, don't you don't, yeah, mindless. Mindless wandering along that, that hypnotic trance. When, when you consider what you just said, the structure, the process of thinking it again and again, thinking the thought, sorry, thinking the thought again and again, we renew our minds by meditating the word, yeah. thinking the thought again and again. It changes, the water of the word comes in and washes, yeah. changes the chemical structure in the physical, washes the debris from the layers of the soul and writes in the truth in its place. So all of the, it, Oh yes. Sir. Oh yes. So yeah. So so it's just you said it. Sorry. It's a crescendo. Here comes the horn. Sorry. Yes. So what I was what I was seeing your crescendo was this beautiful place where the Lord is doing this multiple layered 
thing in us and, and causing us to, ah, salvation to enter into all the spaces. Yeah. You couldn't have said it better. You just. <laughs> so. Yes. So the next bit was, well, how do we stop imagining the negatives, right? That was the. <laughs> But I want you to understand that really when we, we, we allow our thoughts to drift like that, you come into agreement with the enemy. You give him a legal access point where he can actually come into God and say, well, they're in agreement with me. They agree that they've only got a certain amount of time left or they agree that they're always going to be poor. They're in agreement with me. And so we need to be able to, to recognise where we are and to be able to reverse it, the curse, so to speak. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And meditation plays a big part, but I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 first. Because you have been given the mind of Christ. I mean, you have been given the mind of Christ. It is yours. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we're not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow or the destruction of strongholds. We, as, inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we lead every thought captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah. And so he's saying here that we've got to actually um, get rid of those, those strongholds that, that we've built up in our mind of poverty or loneliness or anxiety or sickness or generational infirmities or whatever it is that we have actually um, hosted in our minds. We've actually got to allow the Holy Spirit to point that out to us and say, this is negative, this is working against you. We need to tear that down because it's opposing the true knowledge of God. It's opposing God's knowledge. It's opposing the truth of God. And it's only God's truth that sets us free. It's all it is, is God's truth, Jesus Christ, because he is the truth. And so we have to learn or allow the Holy Spirit to teach us to bring every thought that is contrary to the word of God, to teach us to bring it captive to Christ. I've got a prisoner for you, Christ. It's this thought. Jesus, I've got another prisoner for you. It's this thought. I've got this thought of poverty. It's harassing me. I'm bringing this thought to you, Jesus. It's, it's your prisoner now. I come out of agreement. This is my prisoner. I'm bringing it to you, Jesus. It will not harass me anymore. It's now in your jail. Come on, Jesus, take it. And then we allow him to rebuild in us a structure of godly, a godly structure of his promises, his prophecies, his blessings. We have to live, honestly, in a way that pleases Yeshua. Mm -hmm. We have to live in accordance with the word. It's a narrow path this coming year for God's people. But we've got to learn to take our, our, those negative images, those negative thoughts, take them captive. How dare you try and invade my mind space? How dare you? I've got the mind of Christ. How dare you? We've got to, we're allowed a little bit of righteous anger. So that's verse 6 you're talking about having in readiness. Having to punish. Having to punish. Yeah. All of a sudden. Yeah. 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 So your own submission and obedience is fully secure. Mm -hmm. So verse 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6. So we've got to learn, to, and when you think straight, you live straight. When you think prosperity, you live prosperously. When you think health, you live health. It's about, it really comes down to as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Do you ever have something happen and, you, and something bad, like you just had a, a bend offender or um, something happen and you, you said to yourself, oh man, I knew that was going to happen. Anyone, am I the only one? That is the imagination. The Holy Spirit's trying to show you stuff's going to happen, but we did not take authority over it. We just, oh, 
that's ridiculous or whatever. And it just, but we just let it go. And because we did not bring that into obedience in, as, a, as a hostage to Christ, it happened. And then we go, oh, man, I knew that was going to happen. Well, if you knew it was going to happen, why didn't you do anything about it? Right? I'm folding towels. And the Lord says to me, years ago, the Lord says to me, go upstairs and shut the boys' bedroom door. And I went, yes, Lord, how's that for obedience? Yes, Lord, I'll just finish folding the towels and I'll put them up in the linen press and then I'll shut the door. Between my, yes, Lord, but, my son fell 13 feet out of a window and got a um, fractured skull, didn't think he was going to live. So, you know, like just in that split second because I was not obedient. And we've all done stuff like that, right? And praise God, he was okay. He would have been three months in hospital. He was home in three days. God was so good. Yeah. But it's, it's that having a heart of unquenchable worship and having a heart of unquenchable obedience. Because when Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. And I can say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. But it doesn't mean anything unless my life lines up with obedience. So I want a heart of unquenchable worship and unquenchable loving obedience to please, my, to please him so I can walk worthy with him, so I can just enjoy him. Yeah. Hey, But it comes back to, you know, so be aware when those thoughts come and think, oh, man, I knew that was going to happen. The Holy Spirit was trying to warn you. The imagination was there. And we just didn't do anything about it. If we allow a negative picture to form, we allow a negative future to be established. If you allow a negative picture of yourself being always ill, always having something wrong with you, things never quite working out, always being a little bit poor, if you have this negative picture of, of that picture being formed in you, let me tell you that that will be establishing your future. However, if you have a picture of yourself favoured everywhere you go. Man, I'm just blessed. Everywhere I turn around, I'm just blessed. You know, everything's rigged in my favour. You are establishing a favourable future. So one of the things that has been a challenge for us in, in establishing our destiny has been that we have not understood the power or the place of our imagination. And obviously, I have not imagined a big church. Obviously, I've asked for growth. But what have I actually, I've been asking for growth. Why? Because I think we're small. But if I had the picture of a big church, as big as God wants it to be, let me just put it that way, as big as he wants it, because we, we, I, I pray for the people to come that he wants here, but that he would keep out the people he does not because I, I've got enough hassles. I don't need to have extras coming in. So I just want the people he wants here because that's the best it can be for him, and that's him. So but what I'm saying is think about your life. What negative picture has established you in your current destiny? And it's no condemnation. It's just recognising that we have not understood the place of the, and then the power of imagination in our lives. I think, okay, and I just take authority over the spirit of witchcraft right now in the name of Jesus and I bind and break its power. I take authority over witchcraft. I take authority over slumber. I wake up the slumbering spirit right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I command you to go. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to come. I ask you to come with a fresh fire, a fresh, fresh faith. I ask you to come to burn in these people. I ask you to come with passion. I ask you to come with encouragement. I ask you to come with life and truth. And I just declare right now that the attack of the enemy is thwarted and cast out. And we command it to, to just be cast back into the kingdom of darkness in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. So we've got to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, being ready um, to punish every disobedience. Being ready. You know, so something can happen like... 
in my family, I'll just use my family, I won't say which side, but I'll just say my family. Um, one of my grandparents died of heart disease at a certain age. His son thought he'd die of heart disease at that age. He did. The next one, oh yeah, I think it's going, you know. And they've got this negative image that because this is in the family, because I can see it in the generations, because there's always been an alcoholic or there's always been somebody who's died young or nobody's ever lived past the age of this because that's what that has been in their family. That's what's imprinted in their imagination. That's what they expect. And it, you have to work to get rid of that. Right, all because it's in the family doesn't mean it's in you or in your family because you've now got a new father, you've got a new bloodline, you've got a new DNA. You know, you're, you're now, the blood of Jesus flows through your veins. His DNA is your DNA. Things are different for you now. You know, like the doctors ask, is there any blood disease? And, and No, no, there's nothing. My father's perfectly healthy. You know, like I'm a different family than what I was. Boy, if that asked me when I was, before I was born again, oh, heart disease, diabetes, you know, kidney disease, you know, the list goes on and on. But that's not true now because I live in a different family. I've got a different bloodline. I've got a divine DNA. You know, I'm a new creation in Christ. When God, Jesus Christ redeemed me, it wasn't just my spirit that got redeemed. My body got redeemed. My mind got redeemed. My soul got redeemed. My finances got redeemed. My family was touched. Come Come on, you know what? This is the truth. You've really got to step into this. It's not about you've just become a new creation. You have been made in the image of God himself. You carry the image of Christ. Christ is being formed in you. You are conformed to his image. This is who you are. This is who you are. And don't tell me about, well, you know, this is what it's like in my family. Unless you're talking about God's family, I don't care. I just don't care. It's, we're talking about who you are now. Yeah. Come on. You're going to be walking on the water. You're going to be translating. Come on. Get rid of the stuff that ties you down. Get rid of the tethers. All the things that tether you. I cut the tethers off in Jesus' name. I cut those tethers. You've got to be free in the name of Jesus. Come on. Who are you? The man you've never been seen on the planet before. You're such a new creation in Christ. You, you know, they can't describe you. They don't know how. You're like a divine alien that's lobbed onto the planet. They don't know how to describe you. You've got the mind of Christ. You can come out with divine solutions anytime you want. You know, you can just touch somebody and they can get healed. People can get healed by your shadow as you walk past. You can be talking to somebody here and one second later you can be somewhere else. You serve an amazing God. Jesus Christ is an incredible Lord and Saviour. Come on. Get rid of the tethers that keep you tethered to the things of the earth. You are not of the world system. You do not have the sister spirit of the world. You've been given the spirit of Jesus Christ. Come on, live it. Live it. Live who you are. Oh, my goodness. And that starts in your imagination. It starts in your mind. You've been given the mind of Christ. Let me tell you something. You ever seen Jesus in a car accident? No, right? No car accident for Jesus. No falling off the mule for Jesus, right? That doesn't happen. So if it didn't happen to him, why do you think it's going to happen to you? Right? Because God sends Jesus into the world and then Jesus sends us into the world like God sent him. If you're in him, why? Do you, come on. Come on. If, you, if, if, he, if he, nothing happened to him, apart from persecution for the word's sake and the crucifixion, which praise God he did, we don't. You know, it's happened in the spirit realm. But if it didn't happen to him, if he didn't get sick, why do you expect to get sick? If he didn't have an accident, why do you expect to have an accident? That's not who you are. That's not who you are. And Jesus sends you as the Father sent him, fully commissioned, fully qualified, fully endowed, fully fully, fully complete in him in every way. You are perfect and complete in Christ. Oh my goodness, come on guys. You would be dancing on the table, swinging off the chandeliers, you know, rejoicing. This is, you know, we have got to break the tethers that keep you connected to the things of the world. What is it that keeps you tethered to the things of the world? That keeps you thinking that way? Turn off, turn off the news media. 
You only want to hear from God anyway. He's good news. Come on. Start living who you are. Start living who you are. Expect multiplication. Expect it. Expect it in your food. Expect it in your bank account. Expect it in your coffee. Like, just expect multiplication. <laughs> Clarence King, you know, he, he, his book is incredible. But he got to the stage where he said to his wife, steak's never going to get too dear that we can't afford to buy it. Yeah. He said, we, we're going to be able to afford whatever we want whenever we want. He because money's going to multiply to me. And then he, he freaked out when he saw how much the coffee was costing his wife. And he says, how much you pay for coffee? And she said, yeah. And he says, oh, no, no, no. He said, our coffee's never going to run out. And he kept saying it and it got to the stage where they don't buy coffee anymore. Because it just multiplies. You want to understand who you are. You're made in the image of God. You create your world with your words. What are you saying? How are you creating your world? What kind of world are you creating? You create with your words, made in his image. Come on, come on. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, yes. with all wisdom, yes. as you teach and admonish and train others in all insight and understanding. Come on. Mm. Rise up. Yes. Come, on. come on. Know who you are. Know who you are. You're your father's children, but not your earthly father's anymore. His. Yeah, come on. You're his. Whatever Jesus did, you can do too. Yes. And let me tell you something else. You can do it to the extent that Jesus did it. Because he walked this earth as a man under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. He did not walk this earth as the, in the power of the Son of God. He stripped himself of all of that and left it up there in heaven and came down and was born as a babe and grew up as a young boy and became a young man and became a man. But he lived his life under the power and the influence of the Holy Ghost. And whatever he did, you can do. But he spent time with the Father saying, Father, what is it you'd have me do? So when the woman um, that committed adultery and she's dragged out and, and dumped before Jesus, no mention of the guy anywhere, just her, he knelt down and drew in the ground. Why? Because he's waiting to hear the father's voice. He reflected. When he got the, the loaves and the fishes, you know, he took it in his hand and he looked up to heaven. He realigned himself with heaven. Whatever he did, you can do to the extent that he did it because you have the same power of the Holy Ghost. You have the same authority that's in the name of Jesus. You have the same promises that he lived by. Nothing is different. You can do whatever he did. But he lived in obedience to the Father and we have to come into that place where we live in obedience to Jesus Christ. He is either our Lord or not. He's our Lord, our Saviour, our King. He's our Lord. Come on. So, you know, come on. We're living. Don't, don't allow your imagination to limit you. In my imagination, I translate. In my imagination, I lay hands on and just touch somebody and they're healed. When I just walk past somebody in a wheelchair, my shadow just covers over them and they get healed. That's my imagination, you know. I can wake up in the morning and I'm having a fight with a witch and I'm commanding them, ah, da, 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 da. You, know? you know. You just have fun with this because you're not a human being anymore. You are actually redeemed back to the way God wanted human beings to be. You're redeemed back. To God's original intent and purpose. God's original intent and purpose. Not the way church culture says. Not the way religion says. But the way God says. Perfect in every way. Because Christ is your perfection. It's all about Jesus. And so this imagination thing, I know it's kind of like, what's well, a dippy subject, but man, it'll stop you. From flowing in the, in the rhythm of the Holy Ghost, it'll stop you from believing that you can put hands on the sick and they'll recover. It'll stop you from believing that this thing is never going to end. It's just going to go on and on and on. I've been around this mountain so many times. Nothing ever changes. You know, get rid of it. You've got the mind of Christ. It actually says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, put, on, put off the old mind. And be renewed in the spirit of the new mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 
You've got the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. So if I have the mind of Christ, I have his imagination. I have his imagination. All things are possible. What do you see? What do you see? Spirit of wisdom and revelation, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Because the mental picture determines your actual future. You can't see Jesus being unable to pay his bills. When we are the same as Jesus. We're not him, but we are the same as. So you've got to jealously, diligently guard your mind against negativity. And the very first thing that you should think when something happens is, what does the word of God say about this? Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. It's what you imagine. It sets the, the geographical boundary. Your heart sets the geographical boundary around the issues of your life. What you think is what you will get. What do you actually think about? Oh, my gosh. Start seeing yourself walking through the word of God with Jesus, walking in, in, in his dust, just walking with him into, into different situations and different circumstances. Walk with him. The, the authority that he has, you have. You have that authority. The anointing he carried, you have that same anointing. It's not diluted. It's the same anointing as Jesus Christ. We just don't know how to use it because we haven't spent time asking the Holy Spirit to show us how to flow in it the way he wants. You've got the same aspect of the gifts of the Spirit, the same power. Oh, my goodness, for goodness sake, look inside yourself and you will see more power on the inside of you than an atomic bomb. You can overturn anything. You can stop anything. The power is in you. The kingdom of God is within you. If the kingdom of God is within you, what are you missing? Nothing. Right? It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's my good pleasure to receive it. Whatever you want to give me, I'll take it. Thank you, Father. You know, but come on, guys. How do you see yourself? And I don't want to hear about, well, you know, like, that's just who I am. No, that's who you were. That's not who you are now. Not now that you're born again. Not now that you've been washed by the blood of Jesus. Not now that you've got the mind of Christ. Not now that he's changed the inside of you. Not now. <coughs> so don't tell me that's who you are. That's who you were. Find out who you are. Find out who you are. <coughs> he's amazing. He's awesome. And he's got to be more real to you than the person you're sitting next to. Jesus has got to be. So with Jesus, Yeshua, he's got to be more real. Than, the, than anyone that you know. He's got to be more real than your husband or your wife or your sons or your daughters. He's got to be the reality of your life. It's Jesus. He is your life. So whatever he did, you can do. James Bevere has got a book on the Holy Spirit. And in that, he said that you can have the same ministry as Jesus did to the same extent because you have his authority and you have the same Holy Spirit. Whatever Jesus did, you can do to the same level. You are not Jesus, but you can do it to the same level because Jesus came to show you how to do it. And if he did it as the Son of God, it would be unfair to expect us to live at that level. He did it as a human being under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. So what do you see? Do you see yourself healing the sick? Do you see yourself writing books? Do you see yourself having a ministry, running profitable businesses? What do you see? And then do you see it with the success of Jesus on it? 
And one of the ways that you get that is by meditating the word of God. You just take that word and you meditate it and you take it over and over and over and over again. You chew on it and you allow it to, to dethrone structures and principalities that we've got in our mindset. You allow the power of the washing of the word of God to flow through you. You allow it to build up new altars, new throne for Jesus to sit upon. This is what you do when you meditate. <sighs> Need to be meditating. You know, I don't care if it's five minutes morning or night, but you start meditating and you get so blessed by it that it just automatically increases. But it should be a part of our spiritual disciplines. Dis disciples are disciplined people by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by ourselves, not by our flesh, but the Holy Spirit. It's a devotional thing that we do. You know, it's a devotional thing. So one of the guys that I really love watching on YouTube is Myron Golden. I like him. I love him. He teaches on business. He teaches, he's, he's, um, everything is just from the Bible. Uh, he knows the Hebrew. He's just incredible, Myron Golden. And I just really enjoy his teaching. He stretches me. He makes me think. He makes me grab my Bible and check it out. And Did God really say that? Well, I've never seen it that way. But I love what he does with my head. I love the way he stretches it and the way he shows me things. And he actually has a business where he, t he teaches people to make a million dollars in a day. Make a million dollars in a day for the sake of the kingdom, right? And, he, and, and the scriptures just flow out of him. They just flow out. And I thought, man, I would love the scriptures to flow out of me like they do out of him. And then one day um, he showed us how he did that when he was a, a kid um, doing a in, – in youth – I think it was youth or something. But they had a competition where they had to learn so many verses of scripture, right? So he and his brothers would take seven scriptures – and they'd say them seven times a day, seven scriptures, seven times a day. The next week, they would add seven scriptures and say them seven times a day. But the scriptures from the first week, they would say three times a day. And then the third week, they've added seven new scriptures. The other one, the ones that the second week, they're now three times a day. And the first week are now once a day. So I've started doing that. And I am loving what it is doing for me. But it's, it's finding what works for you because I want the word of God. I want the word of God to dwell in me richly in all wisdom, You're right? The word of God. So whatever works for you, but do it because what the, there's an invitation in the realm of the spirit for you to come up higher. Come up higher. The Lord is wanting to download more revelation into each and every one of you to get you out of where you are because he wants to take you where he wants you to be because next year is a year of promotion for those who will step into it. And so he wants you to listen to him. He wants you to take that step, step up. Get rid of this thing that keeps you where you are. This isn't going to change. I'm always going to have to work for somebody. You know, I've got a nine to five, whatever it might be. Things can be different. Things can change. Listen to him because he's wanting you to step up so that he can bring you into much more because he's got much more for you, much more for you to do for the kingdom, much more for you to be as, as one who represents Jesus Christ, but much more that will fulfill you. He wants you to be fulfilled. And that is when, com when you complete the assignment, the destiny that he's placed on the inside of you. He longs to fulfill you. That's why with Abraham, he didn't give Abraham a, his servant as an heir. He gave Abram and Sarah their own son. And it wasn't Ishmael. It was Isaac. That was what Abraham wanted more than anything else. I just want my own son. And God says, here he is. You might have to wait a bit, but you got him. He wants to fulfill you. And the thing that stops you from being fulfilled is this thing that works against you. Oh, I'm on a fixed income. My, my father said that once. He said it a thousand times. I'm on a fixed income, chick. And I'm thinking, you don't have to stay on a fixed income, Dad. You know, you can, you can make some investments. You can get some interest coming in. You can get to a stage where you can get off the pension. You don't have to live like this. But in his mind, he had retired. He's on a fixed income. That's it. And it was, it was painful to watch because he had seven, I mean, it was $72 a week for food or something and, and cleansing stuffs. And 
he, and he had this he had this system you know, and he knew where every cent went well, that's not abundant living guys that's poverty that's a grind that's not what God has. So, you know, he couldn't even en entertain the thought that life could get better because this is what it is now. But life, God wants you to get life to get better because as your life gets better, other people's lives get infected with his goodness. You affect the people around you. Things change. It's not just about you. It's about the people around you, the people he's called you to, the people he's called you to fund, the different ministries he's called you to fund, the different things he wants you to do in the marketplace. It's not just about you. It's about the people that he's sending you to, the people that he wants you to affect and to implement. And so he's saying you've got a whole new way of living, but you've got to see yourself living it like Jesus. Jesus was never broke. Jesus was never sick. Jesus was never worried. Jesus was never concerned about the future. Jesus was in a relationship with a heavenly father and he knew that his dad was going to take real good care of him, just like he'll take good care of you. And you've got to get rid of these limiting thoughts, these limiting things. Get rid of them. And if you're looking for work and you can't get work, maybe God wants you to start a business. Start thinking about things outside the box. What does God have for you? Get rid of the, the negativity. Get rid of the, the mindset that comes from being a human being on a warped planet. Some evils actually come into our lives through careless imaginations and careless thoughts. And you can't blame the enemy for it. It's something that we've done ourselves. But greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. So you've got to be a believer of a determined imagination that will only imagine God's goodness for you. It will only imagine the power of God flowing through your life. It's like the book of Micah. Oh, my gosh. Seriously. It's like the book of Micah. The Spirit of the Lord fills me. I am full of the power of God. That should be a confession in your life. Every time you walk out the door, you should be walking on the devil's neck. You're placing a foot down. You're placing a foot down, taking his, taking his territory every time you move. Come on. There is so much more to life than what you're living. There is so much more to life than what you're doing. There is so much more to your experience with Jesus Christ than you are experiencing. There are so many more encounters he wants you to have in the realm of the Spirit than you're actually having. There there is so much more, but we settle for so much less. And I'm telling you right now, the Father's heart wants to give you so much more. So are you going to take it? Are you going to take the invitation? Yes, Lord, I want the much more. Yes, Lord, I want the much more. Or are you going to stay where you are? Are you going to accept a medi mediocrity? Are you going to accept where you are? Are you going to accept the mundane? Or are you going to rise up in the realm of the Spirit and go, yes, God! Yes, God, I know what I want. And I want more of you. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, Father. I want to know you better, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I want to flow with you in a unity I've never experienced. I want to live the life you've called me to live, God. I can't live like this anymore. I need to rise up. I need to step into everything you've got for me. Please, God, help me to rise up. Let me, don't let me stay the same. Let me reflect Jesus everywhere I go. Let me speak like Jesus. Let my words be drenched with the beauty of Jesus. Jesus. Oh, come on. Yes. Come on. Let there be such a divine discontent on the inside of you that you just cannot settle for where you are any longer. Just can't settle for where you are any longer. If you knew the passion of the Father's love and the book that he wrote for you out of love and what is in that book for you. And then you look at where you are. Oh, come on. He has so much more. He is the God of much more. Be divinely discontent. See yourself living like Jesus. You have his full authority, the power of his name, the Holy Ghost, the angels of God, the word of God, the promises of God, the prophecies that have been written over your life, the fact that everything 
is rigged in your favour, that all things work together for good because you love the Lord and you're called according to his purpose. Oh my, there is so much more. There is so much more. It's like we're sitting down at one of those all-you-can-eat places and we've just taken a bread and butter plate to the and just put a little bit on the bread and butter plate and we've gone back and sat down and there's all this stuff available and we've just taken this little bit. He loves you so much. He has provided so much more than you can ever, ever need. He loves you so much. He wants you to be fulfilled. Mm. Happiness is in the happening, but joy is eternal. He wants you to know the joy of having a loving Father that provides every need that you have and does not want you to settle where you are. All because life might have been like this for years doesn't mean it has to continue. We can stop it right now just by making a decision.